Let me reference a prophecy about COVID in my book, The Divine Reset. Uh, there's one bit that really interests me with where we're at now in 2022. And it's this paragraph. I'll put the link to the full original prophecy in the description with this program. Listen to this. Um, I wrote in March 2020, though some will grieve as they're touched by personal sorrow to many others, this will be remembered this pandemic time as a time when you asked, what was that all about? A time when fear and panic attempted to take over the hearts of men, but see, I'm enthroned above the flood to bring evil to an end. Worship me, pray, seek my hand. Do not engage in the currency of fear that fills screens and newspapers. Do not be shaken. I decree this shall pass. The times are set by my own authority. I uh, have tracked over the last two years, like, like all of you, uh, this remarkable, weird, unusual journey with COVID and, and government regulations and lockdowns and blizzards of information and misinformation and all kinds of things that have been quite confusing. But I actually believe we are in that period now where I wrote the phrase that it will be remembered as a time of what was that all about? I think we're coming into a time, as the first chapter of the book talks about, when it will be more about the controversies of information and misinformation and lockdowns and what harmed most the lockdown or COVID and all these things. Not that COVID isn't a, a serious thing that everybody's had to work through, but we are now in the period when people are asking, what was real? Uh, what could we have done differently? And the chapter goes on to talk about that. Let me just share one little thing that I thought, and I don't know if this is prophecy or not, it's just maybe perspective. But I remember uh, one thing that was prophecy that Dr. Sharon Stone, Stone said at the beginning of 2021. She talked about the year beginning with trouble, but ending in triumph. Um, well, certainly we had trouble. We were locked down for the first half of the year and all kinds of things going on and it was pretty messy for the second half. But I was looking for this word to be fulfilled that, that will end the year in triumph. Well, we get near the end of the year. I'm talking to people like my friends in South Africa, trying to plan a trip over there and hang up the phone and literally within 24 hours, Omicron had burst onto our screens and suddenly there was all of this worry about Omicron. Now I know from talking to my South African friends, I could hear very early on that they were saying, it's mild, it's mild, it's mild. And these were my prayers. And again, I'm not saying this is prophecy. Let me just give you my perspective of it. I, as I prayed, Omicron means small o. Who knows that God is the big O, he's the Omega. And I started to pray, God, don't let this be Omicron. Let it be the Omega, you bring in this to an end. Well, I listened to one doctor just yesterday saying, you know, Om Omicron is, is displacing Delta and is associated with less hospitalizations, less deaths and less patients being ventilated. It's almost as if Omicron is protecting us against the uh, ravages of Delta. Well, it's not almost as uh, almost like that. It actually is that it's really quite. Quite, quite incredible. And, and, and we know that Omicron gives immunity against Delta as well. So let's pray that this actually is the victory, that something happened at the end of the year with Omicron that actually brings the epidemic, the pandemic to an end. I'm trusting God for an end to all the COVID destruction of the last two years, because who knows, we need a wave of revival healing, healing mental health, <sighs> needs healing for kids, adults, for everybody. We need society economically to be healed. Backlogs of operations and stuff like that need to be caught up on. The destruction has been immense. And we're probably gonna spend a little while going, what is that all about? As I record this, the British government is in the middle of a furore about 
parties going on in government buildings while they were telling us how terrified we should all be and we were wondering whether we could even legally sit on a park bench with someone else to talk in the fresh air and they were partying well we are living in that what was that all about season At the start of this year, when I began to think about plans and strategies and methods for shifting forward in God, and we began to gather again as a church after the Christmas period, I felt God say, make the start of this year not about plans, but about presence. Make it about intimacy with God. Make it about worship. Waste some time on worship. Do you know what I mean? Give time just to be with God. Our hearts kind of need it. People like me want to jump to plans, things to do, strategies, what we do in this year, what are our top focuses and priorities. And actually, I just felt God say, whoa, 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 slow down, Cooper. <laughs> He's always having to tell me that. Slow down and be with me. Don't make the start of this year about plans. Make it about presence. A little while ago, I was walking through a town near where I live and this kind of stuff doesn't happen to me often, but it is a, 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 a common way of God speaking. I've heard of it often, but it doesn't happen to me more than, I don't know, once a year, something like that. I'm walking past a van and it says Bishop's Gate on it. And these delivery men are unloading a massive pallet. It must've been five foot by five foot cubed, you know what I mean? And they were pulling this pallet out the back of a, a, a lorry, a van, uh, with a, a forklift truck. And all that it said on the massive pallet package was glory. And as soon as I saw this glory pallet coming out of this Bishop Gate van, God just said to me, I'm unpacking glory to the back rooms of your life right now. I believe many of us have been longing for God to get a little bit more powerful in the public domain, a little bit more powerful in services. Uh, we, we've been longing for a wave of something extraordinary, but I believe God has been slowly, and that's a key thing, not just like a switch, but more like a fader, slowly increasing the power of his presence among us, but in the secret place, in the intimate place, in the place of worship. We need to give time to be with him because a glory is being unpacked in the hidden places of our lives. If you're like me, you wanna see God do more and do it quickly. You want evidence and fruit, right? But actually I think right at a root level, God is preparing for a wave of glory to hit the church preparing us for a wave of power. We are going to see the miracles on the streets like never before. And something's happening, even at a heart level, to do with the glory and presence of God. So give time to focus on God in this time. Um, just before Brexit happened, I released a prophetic word. And included in that prophetic word that kind of said where Brexit was going was but it ended up being more, more than about Brexit. It was, a, it was about that at the time of Brexit, there's gonna be a rising of houses of prayer and a focus of prayer in such a way that they've not been for a long time in our nation. And I've noticed it bubbling up now over the last year, a bubbling sense of prayer and intercession and worship people beginning to open houses of prayer again in our own church. I've not known a sustained move of prayer like we've had in the last six months or so. Now, it's not extraordinary, it's, but it is above anything that we've known in a long, long time. And I sense the Spirit of God is bubbling up within the radical remnant of the church to say, come on, meet with me. Because when you meet with me, and you meet with each other in intimacy, there's gonna be a powerful effect on the world around about. So hey, let's start this year, not with heaps of plans, but with the presence of God and see where he leads us. Just like in Acts chapter two, I think it leads somewhere extraordinary. I hope you got Welcome back to The Prophet Speak. Today I wanna to talk about worship in this new era. And there are some profound things coming through 
about worship. Not least, someone who I have met, in fact, we shared the stage at a conference once, Bob Sorge has released a new book called Worship in the New Era, Next Wave. And he does a brilliant job of taking the reader through the history of, let's say, spirit-filled worship since about the 60s and how it's developed and periods of spontaneity or when musicality became uh, stronger and stronger uh, uh, and even stagecraft as it's become stronger over the years. But what he concludes is that we've found ourselves in the most recent decade almost back in the 60s version of what worship was, which was, we kind of just sing four songs in a row-ish, and that's pretty much it. And he talks about quite a few things. I wanna highly recommend that you get the book, but one of the things that really resonates with me is getting back to a raw, spirit-filled, spontaneous, prophetic kind of worship that we've had types of in the past, but has largely in recent times disappeared. In fact, worship in many places, even places that will call themselves spirit-filled, has become much more about observing perhaps what's going on on the stage and life has become, even by the very design of our rooms, perhaps a little bit more about what's happening on the platform rather than what's happening with all of us because God's looking for worshipers not worship leaders. I read this the other day. I don't even know where it's from, but it just resonates with some of the things that I think God is correcting in the body of Christ today. Listen to this. It says this, the 16th century reformers shared a deep underlying concern that late medieval worship had become a kind of spectator event. The congregation was largely passive. Worshippers, if they could be thus described, were essentially observers of the drama, of the mass, and listeners to the words of the choir. The service of divine worship was not an event in which the congregants were participants, so much as spectators. The quality of worship was therefore measured not by the holy joy of the worshippers, but by the standard of the music, the excellence of the singing of the choir, the aesthetic impressiveness of the drama of the mass with its vestments, uh, bells, incense, and of course its Latin. Worship was for all practical purposes done for you vicariously. And I think there's been, as lots of good things have happened in worship ministry over the last couple of decades, there's also been a sense in which as churches get bigger and stages get bigger and the lighting rig gets bigger and the band gets louder, that sometimes the congregation is almost forced into a kind of passivity, not true everywhere. I know that you can rise up right wherever you sit in any place and go, no, I'm gonna worship. But there's very subtle, thing, uh, subtle things happening where I'm not quite sure that our stage design lines up with our theology truly. What we really want is an uprising. And this is what happens in revival, an uprising of the people, the body of Christ rising up in worship and in praise and in following the Holy Spirit, almost like a, a murmuration of starlings as we move together, led by the Holy Spirit. I believe something radical is happening in the area of raw, spontaneous worship from the body. In our church, we're almost quietening the stage down a little bit to give more room so that the stage, the pulpit, is not occupied by just a few people, but rather the body of Christ is coming through. Listen for a new sound from heaven. It's coming through in this season. Don't smother it with our stages and our pulpits and our platforms. Let's listen for the sound of the Spirit being born in the body of Christ. Something new is arising. Let's give him space. I highly recommend this book, Next Wave, Worship in the New Era by Bob Sorge. The link for it will be in the details of this little program. I hope you got something. The Divine Reset is my take on what God is saying right now, as well as words from prophets, around the world and other remarkable people that have been speaking into the life of church, 
global pandemics, this divine reset time when everything seems to be changing. God spoke to me very early on and showed me that we were coming into a pause season. That was just months before the pandemic started. Then he showed me a pit stop where things were gonna be changed around that would lead to a new acceleration in the body of Christ. And then on I go through various words and remarkable dreams that God shared with me in the last couple of years. That will inspire you, I believe. This book is written in such a way that you can do it with your team and begin to pivot, ready for the new season ahead. Know what God is saying, know where he's leading you. Be inspired, prepared and positioned for the future. The Divine Reset is currently discounted on our website. Have a little look. I hope that I can inspire you, position you and push you into the grace of God, ready for the new era. A little while ago, I had a dream and in it, the congregation in this church were running out the back door to go preach the gospel. I'll put the link for the full version in the description with this program. But here's the main thing. As I woke up from this dream, the Lord said to me, the church has left the building. Now, we live in a cold country here in the UK and you need a building to meet out of the snow and out of the rain. So it's not that we've literally stopped meeting uh, somewhere where there's a roof and four walls. But I believe God is saying that the church has left its sense of being so building centric, so focused on stage and platform and pulpit and building and the way that we've been constructing church is about to change because something's happening in our hearts. Andrew Murray, one of our great teachers at Revive, shared a brilliant word last Sunday. And this would be the heart of it, that at the center of the church, it's not supposed to be a pulpit, it's supposed to be a table. And that's the, the table, yes, of the Lord's Supper and communion and, and remembering the death and resurrection of Christ, but also it's the table of fellowship. So many things that Jesus did were done in and around meal tables and parties rather than, ch rather than church services and crowds. Even though, of course, he did loads of stuff with crowds too, but maybe we've just, some of us, over-designed church for the crowd and we've forgotten the value of small, intimate family uh, and all the things that that can do. I was talking to a friend of mine, Rachel Hickson, uh, the other day, and we were chatting about these kind of size dynamics of what happens in a church. As soon as you get to more than 80 people in a room, it becomes an event, not a family gathering, whatever you call it, the social dynamics change. So Rachel was trying out events that were capped at just 50 people. And the first one that she did, it, it was wonderful because kind of everybody got to talk to everyone, she said, and we all had communion. And at the end, there was this wonderful, respectable 50-something-year-old man with his wife, and he was weeping. And, and she was a little bit worried, is, is it okay? Why are you weeping? And he, he said something like this. He said, you know, in 17 years of going to church, nobody has ever prayed for me. And that's what happened when church becomes an event instead of a family. But I believe something dynamic is happening in lots of different ways that is pushing us out from our building focus, back out to share the gospel with the world, to go deep with God in new ways, and to go deep into deep relationship with each other. As soon as a church gets over a couple of hundred people, well, you, you don't know everybody's names. Even the pastor doesn't. So we tend to know about half the people there and then sometimes in our commuter churches, we're all so fragmented that we're not even quite sure we like the half that we do know. And we end up with these very thin relationships. Well, I believe we're in a season where the church has left the obsession with the building and the obsession with the crowd. I've just got this phrase burning in my heart. The show is over doesn't mean that we don't know how to do good, attractional, fun stuff and concerts and do things well, but at the very core of our being, there should be much more of a sense of family than the occasional ability to put on a concert style service. The show is over. It's time to get real, real in relationships, 
real with God and real with reaching the world. I hope Leadership awesome. Quest. This is currently discounted on our website. And as you go through all the workings of how do we change ready to be everything that God wants us to be in this new era, uh, it'll help us get our mind around some of the innovations and some of the changes required for leadership as we step into a future together. The Leadership Quest, this is volume one. It's my journey of leadership and how I'm coping with trying to get more flexible, more innovative and work around my own weaknesses and strengths to be everything God's called me to be. Maybe it'll inspire you. I hope it will. Have a look on our website for The Leadership Quest. In my prophetic book, The Divine Reset, I talk about a new era of innovation that's coming upon the church right now. And we're just beginning to see that bubble up, aren't we, in all new models of doing church and doing ministry. It's almost like, and this is what I said in the book, it's like the church is coming to its own industrial revolution when the materials and the things that we work with and how we work get so transformed in such an accelerated way that church really begins to look innovative and different. Some of us are going to struggle for our theology to keep up with it. Some of us are going to struggle for our behaviors to keep up with it. But this is what's happening. There is a massive move of innovation going on in the church right now. Churches that had been big and attractional and going after a certain model are radically transforming their model. So look out for this because the Spirit of God is speaking. There are styles of church that are stepping away from those big platform centric services maybe only doing that once or twice a month and really pushing things into smaller groups, into much more missional groups, and maybe even churches in the home and phrases, words like micro church are beginning to arise. Now listen, I think it's really important that we recognize in this time, as we change our models, make sure you dismantle, you don't demolish. Don't demolish what's happened in the past. Respect it. You're supposed to love and honor the old wineskin and preserve it too. Stick it on a wall and thank God for his faithfulness, but then also work towards new wineskins. I think careful leaders, wise leaders and loving leaders will carefully dismantle what was so that it's not destroyed and then begin to rework it in new ways. One prophetic word that we had for revive is that we were like an old galleon ship that God was about to dismantle and break it down into smaller pieces and build these new little catamarans that headed off on mission doing things for God. God is dismantling. Wise leadership will dismantle wisely. We're finding churches that are putting all of their services online. I'd struggled with that dynamically. So you've got to be very honest about how God uses you and what your call is. But I do know of a church that sold their kind of mega sized building and they've just kept all of their outreach projects and they're doing their worship online. It wouldn't work for me. It might not work for you, but there are going to be innovations that will cause it to work. Uh, about six months before the first lockdown, I had a dream and in it, I was ministering to people online and uh, didn't really excite me that much, but we built a studio in our home and began the tribe, which is now a learning community of hundreds of people around the world growing in God together. Huh. Uh, before the pandemic, we might have done well to have 20 or 30 people in a classroom learning. Now we've got hundreds around the world learning through a new innovation. Some churches are going to look, start to look a bit more like parachurch. Some churches are going to begin to operate under the guise of businesses. I'm hearing of several churches that are heading off buying land and farms and developing much more of a community sense in this fast-paced commuter world where churches are struggling with fragmentation. Be brave. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Maybe a good thing to do is sit and write, if I was brave, if I did the fresh, innovative thing in my gut, what would I do? Wow, it's amazing what things you might write. And here's what I'd say too, that 
Maybe some are just trying to put church back together as it was. And you know, maybe that's appropriate for some, absolutely. I won't discredit it. But I'd also say this, if you know you're not an innovator, you're not a pioneer, you're, you're, you're a late adopter, which is a perfectly respectable and godly place to be, we're all wired differently. I would say, even as you're moving out of this pandemic period and, and things are beginning to come back, Keep your eyes and ears open. Go visit places that are innovating and catch the smell of what the Holy Spirit is saying because some are early adopters running and trying out and experimenting. And you might not early adopt, you might not be the quickest or the first there. Hey, but you can learn from the mistakes of the pioneers and those that really push the boundaries and go, hey, okay, there's some things in God that I can grasp there. Also, the best place to find innovation is in the presence of God. God, what are you saying to us? There are new era models of church rising in this time. Let's build lovingly, wisely, but also don't get paralyzed in fear. Make sure you are building, stepping forward, experimenting and exploring, because there's some remarkable stuff that God has for us in the coming years. The Divine Reset is my take on what God is saying right now, as well as words from prophets around the world and other remarkable people that have been speaking into the life of church, global pandemics, this divine reset time when everything seems to be changing. God spoke to me very early on and showed me that we were coming into a pause season. That was just months before the pandemic started. Then he showed me a pit stop where things were gonna be changed around that would lead to a new acceleration in the body of Christ. And then on I go through various words and remarkable dreams that God shared with me in the last couple of years that will inspire you, I believe. This book is written in such a way that you can do it with your team and begin to pivot ready for the new season ahead know what God is saying know where he's leading you be inspired prepared and positioned for the future the divine reset is currently discounted on our website have a little look I hope that I can inspire you position you and push you into the grace of God ready for the new era ahead I hope you got some this is a time of church innovation like no other. I believe we're gonna know this time as a era of innovation for the church. A little while I wrote a book called The Multi-Site Church Adventure, how to begin to reach new communities as a multi-site church, but not by taking the big kind of mega church cookie cutter model, but rather how do we release teams and groups of people to transform a region in remarkable new ways. This doesn't tell you how to do it my way. This gives you ideas to learn how to do it in the way that God wants you to lead and grow church and have an impact. If you sense that you need to be starting new groups and new models of church in this time, the multi-site church adventure will help you in that journey. It's currently discounted on our website. I hope it brings you some inspiration. Is the era of the megachurch over? Oh, that's a controversial thing to say, isn't it? Huh. The thing is, huh, I don't know about you, I don't have a thing against large churches at all. The way I see it is the more people saved, the better. God's out for people to get saved. The church in Ephesus was reputed to be 50,000 strong, so God doesn't have a problem with size but maybe he's dealing with some of the things in our models that aren't quite where they should be. Hmm. I'm gonna read some of it. It's, it's not mine, it's by a prophetic guy. I, I really enjoy his ministry. From Australia, Steve Penny, he's a proper straight-talking Aussie. Met him a couple of times, love his ministry to bits. And I know that he, like me, is a friend of the mega churches. He preaches in some of the most well-known mega churches out there. But listen to what he said the other day. 
as he was talking, one of his posts on Instagram said this, the reset of the church is coming. And of course, you'll know from my book, The Divine Reset, that I completely agree there's a reset going on. Listen to what he said about mega churches. He says this, the 20th century obsession with mega church has now come to an end. Watch God use the controls of the world to send the church into real and authentic small groups. Not yet, as people are still blind to what is coming and see no need to become genuine in their Christian walk. The current preaching is all about restoring what we had before. Sadly, we can never go back to what was yesterday's season. But soon, the small group will flourish as the place of real love, real faith, real spirituality, real support, real humility, and real togetherness. The syndrome of size is finished. I think something is bubbling and struggling in the mega church. I know from some of my conversations with leaders of large churches that they were finding, even before the pandemic, that the amount of people getting saved through that model was going down and down. And the frustrations of how do you turn people that raise a hand in a service to real disciples was getting harder and harder. Something needed to change. Uh, I suppose in our church, we were running after a larger church model simply because we got to a certain size and what churches have done for decades decades is you just keep buying a bigger box for so more people can come to church that's good right but when you know and you can sense and you, you you know from your statistics even it's getting more and more transfer growth it's getting less and less discipleship and in the commuter western world it's getting more and more fragmented and we ain't going to go too far unless we can have genuine unity that's brothers that dwell together not just go to church services together. Something needed to happen. And I'm glad that God drew a line in the sand and gave people like me time to think and go, what's God saying about the big church model? Now, I believe some people will be very anointed to put big church together well, and it's discipleship and it's godly, because heck, we, we got, you know, 7 billion people we want to see saved, right? We're going to have to have some big churches to do that. But also, there's something beautiful rising up about small, the value of small. In the future, I believe small will outstrip the big. Small will have a pace to it. The pioneers are going to be in smaller places that run in remarkable ways. Some of the most profound moves of God are going to hit small communities and they begin to see ripples of transformation. Why a lot of people that have a smaller setup are not obsessed about building empires or owning everything that they influence. No, in the future, you won't have to own to influence. You won't have to build empire to prove your fruitfulness us will realize we're one church one team so when somebody moves from my church to another church the church hasn't shrunk he's just moving around the furniture let's start to get relaxed about the fact that we're one team let's get some of our empire building models out of our hearts and begin to run more truly in the things of God now this is going to be painful for some guys with big mortgages and models that they've been driving for a couple of decades, for them to sit down and go, is this really the healthiest way to build? It's gonna be a tough journey for some. Hmm. Some will be graced to make it, but we've gotta be true to ourselves and know when God is calling us to turn a corner with him and head off in a new industrial revolution, a new kingdom revolution, a new kingdom innovation time with him. Something's changing in the mega churches. Ha, Steve Penny, great guy to follow. I'll put the link to his Instagram, Instagram account in the details with this program. Follow him, you may just get inspired. Come and join our online learning community, The Tribe. We've got 700 modules of teaching on the prophetic, leadership, worship, creativity, mental health, all kinds of stuff, uh, just to help you grow in God. We've got Zoom sessions together. We've got books that you can receive. There is Come and join us and let's grow in this prophetic journey together. Hey, but if not...
I believe many are in a stage of transition right now, shifting from one dynamic to another or from one group of relationships to another. And who knows, that's a complex time. And Christians are often really bad at doing it. <laughs> we really struggle with very honest conversations that, that really just say, hey, this season has finished. I'm moving over here. Or I'm shifting from A to B or new relationships or new ministry responsibilities. Sometimes we're a bit bad at that. So a lot of our wars happen in and around transition. So let me see if I can help you for a minute. Uh, Daily Prophetic, someone I love to follow on Instagram, posted this the other day and I thought it was great. Let me read it to you. Uh, and I'll put the link uh, to his prophetic Instagram account uh, in the details with this program. It says this, when God transitions you, often long before you move on physically from a place, ministry or assignment, you'll begin to sense a shift inside. It'll be subtle at the start. But over time, this inner stirring will intensify. Boredom, discontentment, loss of passion, change, changes in relationships, feeling contained or constricted. You'll begin to detach a little. Emotionally, you're not as invested as you used to be. You still show up and give it your best. But it's very hard to have any clear vision for your future because you imagine your future will be different to your present. Hey, uh, I, I would add that very often, when we're coming into a time of transition. It's like the grace lifts and everything becomes clunky and a bit difficult. And I believe many are going through that right now. Now, it might not be that you're meant to move uh, church or ministry. Maybe you're just moving from one team to another or one responsibility to another or a different stage of life that requires some different diary commitments. But for many, there is a change of church family or ministry family. Be aware when the grace lifts and you go, why has this all gone horrible? This is what immature, immature people will do. They'll blame everyone around them. They'll blame the old leader who no longer seems impressive because you haven't got your grace goggles on anymore. Do you know that when you join a place and God joins you to a leader, God gives you grace goggles to put up with all the madness and the humanity of the leader you've now got to follow. But you know, when he's about to move you, the eagle stirs up its nest. That's a scripture, right? Which means the eagle pulls out all the nice downy feathery fluff and suddenly you're left with these twigs and these spikes poking you up the backside and no, the nest no longer feels comfortable. People no longer seem quite as easy to get on with the grace is lifting, the season is changing, and it's usually that frustration and uncomfortable feel is the first sound of a new day hitting your life. Yes, frustration, discontent, and a bit of grumpiness for those around about you. Now, of course, not all grumpiness is God speaking. Sometimes it's just we that need to grow up, repent, be in God's presence and soften up a bit. But listen, if you can't shift it, if you just know everything's changing and it just feels different and the relationships feel clunky. Understand the grace may have lifted and you need to get some time to seek God and say, God, where are you taking me? Where are you leading me? And then listen, hmm. what happens when you lose your grace goggles is that you want to blame other people uh, they're no longer who they used to be. They're not giving me the time. They're not making the decisions I like. It's their fault and I'm having to go. No, 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 no. Uh, grab the grace for change, which is in the air right now, the grace for transition, and leave people that you've walked with for many years with honor and thanks and hugs and kisses and love and appreciation for the season that's been recognized that it's all gone clunky just because God's changing the season. So always leave with honor, because usually how you leave is how you enter. So if you leave badly, you normally start badly and that can affect the whole journey for the next season of your life. So leave well, enter well in this time of transition. I hope you got some. God said to my wife, Vicky, just a little while ago, don't be delicate, stand up and be strong and pray. <laughs> I don't know about you, but one of my issues in life is being too delicate, too easily wounded, too thin-skinned. Well, part of my adventure and learning about that has been to write a book called Stronger, which is my journey of getting stronger in God and not giving in to the delicate sides 
of my nature, our nature. How do you get strong? How do you endure? It's one thing to have a dream from God. It's another thing to persevere and see it happen. Well, Stronger is currently discounted on our website. This particular edition comes with a devotional at the back that will lead you through 40 days of becoming stronger in God, as well as the full book and group discussion questions so that you can do it as a group if you want. Currently discounted on our website. I hope it helps you get stronger. This is more of an observation than a prophetic word, but church studies at the moment are saying that really the church has split into three groups during the time of the pandemic. And it's kind of where we find ourselves at as we head into a post-pandemic new era world. And the church studies kind of show this, that really your, shall I say, back row third, you know what I mean, that, 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 that those that have moved to the back and were a bit backslidden anyway, have largely left. And then you've kind of got a middle third that were always quite committed. They might tie, they're lovely people and good Christians and they're, they're, they're with you, but instead of coming once a fortnight, they're now coming once every six weeks to church and they're, they're less involved and slowly disappearing off some teams that they might have been involved with. And so there's a middle third that have kind of, they've moved back to the back row as it were, and wondering uh, about life and pandemics and their diaries changed and the pressure and maybe a bit more fearful and struggling to quite grasp where they're going. Those two thirds are a real struggle for church right now because it's a group of people that have either disappeared or they become people that you can't depend on. The disappeared and the ones you can't depend on ain't gonna help you in leadership, okay? You can love them, you can run after them when you feel called to, or you can wait at the door like the prodigal son's father waiting for them to come home. But listen, it's not all bad news. Church studies show that right now there is the last third, your front row third, and then they might have swapped around a bit. You might be surprised who's in your front third, right? There is a group that are a radical remnant that are ready now to give more than ever, to serve more than ever. They can smell revival is in the air. They're the ones beginning to fill prayer meetings in new ways. They're the ones beginning to get excited about new innovations and new vision. They're not stuck in the past. They can sense that this is a new era and God may just be about to do something remarkable. Listen, really value the radical remnant because I believe the future belongs to the radical remnant. I got a whole teaching on that. And if you stick with us at the tribe, you'll get to hear a whole teaching about the radical remnant and how we can be radical in the days to come. I hope you got something. In my book, The Divine Reset, I talk about the fact that I believe the era to come is going to be very special for what I've called the silver surfers, the slightly older saints who may be with thinking of retirement, but actually God is coming and bringing refirement. <laughs> Many of them have served in leadership. They've done remarkable things. They've got great testimonies in the past, but they've also got a heart that's hungry for revival, hungry for prophetic words that they've had since the 80s and 90s, maybe even before, to still be fulfilled. And they've got something of the spirit of Caleb about them. And there's a little battle going on in some of them right now. Spirit of Caleb or the spirit of the culture around about us. The spirit of Caleb says this, hey, I might be 80, but in the Bible, he said, give me one more mountain. I'm as energetic as when I started. I love that. There's something of a spirit of Caleb, but some are succumbing to the spirit of the culture. I've reached a certain age. It's time to retire. I should no longer have the pleasures of some of these thoughts about ministry and fruitfulness and fulfillment. And there's a little tussle going on inside them that can my body quite keep up with what my spirit would love to do if I had the energy again of a 25 year old? Well, I've got a word for you. Refirement is coming. New energy is coming. And you might have been 
tired by the recent journey, but I believe like Elijah in the presence of God, the still small voices of heaven is coming to you. And when he looks at you and you're feeling a little bit tired, remember Elijah was pretty worn out in those scriptures where he encounters God on the mountain. And instead of God saying, hey, take a rest, take it easy, you know, get a, get a villa in the Mediterranean and just relax for the rest of your life. No, what God actually does is give Elijah more work to do. You see, sometimes in a recommissioning, there's a restoration. It's amazing. Sometimes we think, I need the grace of God to give me a rest. And God says, no, actually, my grace is found in my work. My grace is found in recommissioning. There's a new call from heaven coming to the silver surface. Some of you are going to end your days on the mission field, not in an armchair. You're going to end your days in the adventure of the kingdom of God coming. So rise up, silver surfers. There's a call coming from heaven, and you're going to find that along with the recommissioning, there's going to be a fire, there's going to be a grace, there's going to be an energy, and there's going to be a joy. Do you know what I think God wants to do? He wants to make sure that the church at this time is full of fathers and mothers, mums and dads, full of grandfathers and grandmothers that are doing remarkable things. Why you are going to bring such a stability and a sense of bravery and a sense of adventure to all the young generation, those divine young arrows coming through. So come on, rise up, hear God, hear his commission and receive his grace. I hope you got some. The Divine Reset is my take on what God is saying right now, as well as words from prophets around the world and other remarkable people that have been speaking into the life of church, global pandemics, this divine reset time when everything seems to be changing. God spoke to me very early on and showed me that we were coming into a pause season. That was just months before the pandemic started. Then he showed me a pit stop where things were gonna be changed around that would lead to a new acceleration in the body of Christ. And then on I go through various words and remarkable dreams that God shared with me in the last couple of years that will inspire you, I believe. This book is written in such a way that you can do it with your team and begin to pivot, ready for the new season ahead. Know what God is saying, know where he's leading you. Be inspired, prepared, and positioned for the future. The Divine Reset is currently discounted on our website. Have a little look. I hope that I can inspire you, position you, and push you into the grace of God, ready for the new era. I believe that for many, the season to come is going to be marked by the word effortless. God's grace wants to come to some that have really been striving to see God come through. And God actually wants you to sit, to rest, to be still and know that he is God. That literally means to down tools. And what's the result? The next line says, and I will be exalted in the nations. I'll be exalted in all the earth. God gets exalted when we rest. He is wanting to teach us the effortless rhythms of grace. I love that phrase, don't you? Uh, my wife Vicky had a dream a little while ago and God just spoke these words in the dream. It was Sabbath outpouring, no striving. I believe there's gonna be an outpouring of Sabbath rest where we sit back. Yes, we work, but we, we do it from a place of sitting back in the power and the grace and the mercy of God. And he does the things that we could never do. Things that we've strived to get accomplished, he just makes happen. People that we've tried to get saved suddenly come to Christ. Projects that we've tried to get off the ground, debts that we've tried to get paid for, healings that we've tried to trust God for suddenly break through. When we give up and fall back into the arms of God and he begins to carry us. There's something remarkable about it. I remember as a kid, 
following my dad around as he was itinerantly preaching one sermon on one particular trip. We were missionaries, so we were back visiting all of our supporting churches. And so as a youngster, I must have heard this sermon a dozen times. And he preached about the eagle that stretches out its wings and rises on the updrafts of the warm thermals of air. Not a sparrow, an eagle is who God wants us to be. And that's what it is. You can go higher on rest. Both have got wings, but both are just using the environment differently. I don't want to be a striving sparrow. I believe God's call is to be eagles that rise on the thermals of his grace in this season. So look for it. Don't strive to force things happen. Sit back enveloped in his grace, focused on him, trusting him, and you're going to see God comes through for you. Let's let God show off and do remarkable things among us. One little story as I finish. I remember being in a meeting with a load of wonderful leaders, apostolic guys, and we were having an awesome prayer time. All the hands were raised. Everybody was praying in tongues. There was a sense of God's power in the room. And I was stood in front of an armchair. It must have been a circle of maybe 20 seats. And I just felt this hand from heaven come and push my chest and shove me back into the armchair that was behind me. And as I fell back, I heard God say, you'll do more seated. God has spoken to me again and again about ceasing striving. And instead, my work is to believe in him, to trust him, to fulfill all that he wants to do. I'm not trying to fulfill my plan anymore. How about you? I just want to join God in his plans and he will do them. He will make the way straight. He will work in me to do, to will and to do according to his good pleasure. God's going to do it. Let's trust him. Sabbath outpouring. No striving. I hope you got some. I want to share with you a prophetic word from someone whose ministry I love. And I'm going to put the link to follow her on Instagram and also to read the fullness of uh, this prophetic word I'm going to share. Uh, I'm just going to share a few snippets from it because it's too long to read the whole thing right now. But Lana Vosa said this uh, back in September 2021. But I, th I think it's still significant to today because of where it points to and where it leads. Listen to this. I heard the Lord say there's a new path before you. Don't deviate from it, for this pathway leads to houses of my glory. Lana's been saying something that resonates with me so much that God is beginning to establish houses of his glory around the world. Many of the houses of prayer are going to become houses of glory, hotspots, places where there are wells dug for the glory, the miraculous, the power and the presence of God to begin to emerge in new ways. We know the end game, that God wants to cover the earth with his glory as the waters cover the sea. I believe part of that is going to be done through groups of people being called to start houses of prayer and houses of worship that become houses of glory. If you worship and you linger and you pray and you get intimate with God, you are going to find like the upper room became a place of outpouring, a house of prayer becomes a place that holds the glory of God and people will stream from across the face of the earth to these houses of glory and listen there's going to be loads of them not one hot spot in the earth there's going to be loads of them as God begins to move but let me read a couple of further lines because what she is saying and she felt from God is so don't deviate because some of you are being called to pioneer in radical new ways the fear of man might get to you the sense of your own Cleansing as God begins to work things through in our hearts might uh, distract you. But listen to this. Some have been in a threshing floor, she says, a cleansing time. But she says this, the threshing floor place has been so intense for so many. And for many, it's felt like the most intense moment of relentless opposition, but also the refiner's fire to purify and prepare. But now his glory shall be seen and revealed. It will bring a joy that others have not experienced before in partnering with the Spirit of God to see his kingdom extended. Listen to this. There's no need to fear. God is with you. He's gone before you. Continue to seek his wisdom and obey his instruction as you walk down this path. Remain tender in the place of sensitivity before him to lead you 
and guide you. You're moving into a season of experiencing the weight and the manifestation of his glory in unprecedented ways. Stick with the path to a house of glory if that's what you're called to do. God is doing something remarkable. Come and join our online learning community, The Tribe. We've got 700 modules of teaching on the prophetic, leadership, worship, creativity, mental health, all kinds of stuff, uh, just to help you grow in God. We've got Zoom sessions together. We've got books that you can receive. There is Come and join us and let's grow in this prophetic journey together.